Hey guys, should and could insurance companies win the hearts and minds and home screens of insurance companies? That was a topic of the panel I moderated at the InsureTech Insights. I had great panelists, I had experts from the different lines of business of the insurance industry. There was Carl, John, Roman, Natalie and Josh. And we had a C-suit discussion about rethinking customer experience to gain customer loyalty. And already the first question was quite provocative. But have a look yourself. about this panel um, and why um, and not only because we have great experts here but actually we're talking about um, the customer and I think and that's going to be really exciting um, yes but before there was a lot of, already a lot of friendship going on um, between the panelists and I think we need to really change this new now on the panel um, to start with, maybe instead of a, a traditional introduction, and nevertheless, um, um, just say a few words about yourself. Like one personal, one private. Um, I can um, uh, do it first. Who am I? I'm a recovering a um, insurance sales agent, now helping insurers and banks with this internet thing. And my private thing is I'm a diet hammock sports club fan, waiting for the first title for 30 years. Um, yeah, and we're second league right now, so that's going to be, take some time. Um, Carl, maybe one private, one personal. Um, personal. Um, the name is Carl Christensen. I've been with Citrine now for five and a half years. Uh, originally from Scandinavia. Um, Trying to get out of there as quickly as possible because I hate the cold. And I guess the private irony is my kids play ice hockey, so I spend all time traveling on cold time. Mm -hmm. That's what I Hey, good morning. I'm John Cooper. I'm the founder and CEO of Life.io. My kids also play ice hockey. And um, I'll tell you something more interesting about my co-founder. So I founded this business with my best friend about seven years ago. And um, he's taken a different path for me. So my kid is very stable. He has ridden a bike from Alaska, a bicycle, not a motorcycle, Alaska to Argentina, 16,000 miles. And over Christmas, while we were doing the Christmas celebrations, he embedded himself with the Iraqi Peshmerga as a photojournalist, and that's how he spends his um, Christmas vacation. So the ongoing joke is, is he insurable? <laughs> no. <laughs> Hi, my name is Roman. Uh, I like to do new things. That's why I personally play with lots of people who are ice hockey players, but actually uh, who play inline hockey, and I'm the worst guy in the group, but I still have fun. I also started to surf, which also I don't really know how to do, but I also have fun. And I also did start a uh, health insurance, and I have a bit of more knowledge there because I'm a physician by training, and we are a digital online health insurance who uh, have the best customer satisfaction in Germany, and we're also selling some digital tools to other health insurers. Um, hi, my name is Natalie. Um, we found Cover uh, about three three years ago. Our main office is in San Francisco. Um, I'm based out of Toronto, where our engineering office is. Um, Cover is actually my second business um, with my, my co-founders. Um, initially, we, uh, we founded a fashion and e-commerce uh, startup, so I'm very qualified to talk about insurance today. <laughs> um, and then we were Aqua hired into, into Shopify, so it was more e-commerce experience. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Josh Hart. Uh, so I, uh, I'm a diagnosed medicated hypochondriac. And, uh, I, I think what you sort of joke about it, but uh, my psychiatrist said it was real, so now I take the pill. So, um, I also uh, co-founded a life insurance business, um, and uh, it was a fairly traumatizing experience. The um, I uh, married my childhood sweethearts. I uh, and just very quickly about my company, New Life, uh, kind of sells group life insurance and then rewards people for living healthier. And builds communities around well-being and companies. Um, all right. Well, um, and, and we will also talk about insurance topics, not only the self-help topics we have been talking right now about. And um, maybe um, uh, we have here a focus group also on stage. We real guys are not only decision makers in the insurance industry, founders um, and managers, but actually customers and digital customers yourself. I would like to have a quick round in this focus group. And um, what is your favorite app right now, and why? Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, will be next week. Okay, cool. Uh, assuming um, media is good. My favorite app is the Life.io app. I recommend everyone check it out. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite app is the Seven Mind app, which is a meditation app. Okay. Um, I, I'm tied for two, so I would say Headspace is also a meditation app. Um, and then Robin Hitzemode, which is a stock trading app. Okay, and with that, that would have all yeah. reading solid. <laughs> and, uh, it was really awesome. Time to speak. Yeah. Cool. 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 Mine is a, a, a podcast app, so that's my favorite. And, and Netflix, but you cannot say it's a podcast. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> um, considering that, I think all um, the apps you mentioned um, um, have a really high engagement rate. If not, they would not have. Um, conquered your part mind at home screen from um, consuming entertainment to finance to health to mental uh, um, health and big question um, one now could argue and say is it actually is insurance also a product that ha should have a high engagement with the customer or is it actually a product that simply due to its structure cannot um, and maybe Josh, um, what is your take on that? I think um, generally life insurance, in a way it's structured at the moment, isn't um, designed. Brokers have relationships with customers, carriers do not. Um, they try to, um, but they have not succeeded as yet. There are some loyalty programs that they've been using, but it doesn't really have a meaningful engagement with that end to consumer in the same way it would have as for me. Um, and I think for us to imagine otherwise is not a reflection of our industry today. Uh, Roman, uh, and you mentioned this in, in half a sentence uh, that you guys have quite a well, good NPS score in your whole market, Germany, in a way to say it's not just a nice and, and net promoter score, but I think you're leading by a big, big, big margin the whole market. Um, what do you say to that? Well, just for the audience, the, the average NPS in German health insurance is 13. Uh, the second best is uh, 20, 26, and we have an NPS of 17. And the reason for that is that we really uh, interact a lot with, the, with, the, with our insured population. And granted, it's much easier to have insurance because uh, even if you're young and healthy, you still need to go uh, to the dentist. You, know, you still may have uh, a cold and may want not to go to work and uh, have a um, video visit with a doctor who can send you a paper that you can stay home. So, what we do is uh, we have a, the best thing that we have is a chat, an interactive chat that we um, basically design ourselves because all the currently available chats would basically transfer the data at one point to the United States and uh, the German regulators would not have that. And so we have the chat and the chat basically goes in as an asynchronous chat as you have in, in other chat functions. It goes in to us, to our customer service. Then it's branched out afterwards to different services behind it. And uh, so it's very easy for our uh, client to communicate with us. And we also, on top of that, have something we call that Eat Move Mind, where we do something for the healthy people to, so they can feel better. And That's what I wanted to ask because, okay, if the person is sick or has a claim, I think everybody on stage has says, okay, if there's a claim, if there's an incident, we need to engage with the customer and fulfill all our contractual duties. The big question there, I think, from the Netflix and the other apps here, uh, the question is, um, do you need to engage outside this these sort of events? Yeah, and that's Josh said no. Yeah. Yes, and one thing I would add, though, is to that end, you know, you can design adjacent experiences. So, in an ideal world, why, why can the life insurer not give you Netflix as a way of engaging on a day basis, right? But we all value, we value it. Netflix and these are the tools we value, and insurance is a dumb pipe, and by that I mean, it doesn't actually have anything that's a commodity, right? So how can we create more engaging experience by using adjacent markets and adjacent experiences? Down the high car, what do you say about that, Jesse? No, I, maybe just a common old job. I think I think they um, they found quite an innovative way of creating engagement with the life cycle of the policy and going into a group life speed. I think um, you know what many of us do is, is really trying to sell life insurance from a pure digital perspective. And here, if we talk about Customer engagement. What really is critical is to see how you get engagement to get clients to acquire policies. Yeah. Uh, the big challenge that we are facing as a digital industry is that we're not acquiring enough clients. It's just far too expensive. Or Google makes too much money with it. 
Well, that's one of the large reasons, and we have to debate around that. But I think you know we, we should also not you know necessarily kid ourselves as an industry that are really individual sales focus agents today do a reasonably good job of that. If there is some advisory need still there. But we really need to focus our engagement topics around how do we acquire clients in an effective way. I mean, we, we all feel passionate that digital will be an evolution that will occur, both in insurance. Um, so really, how do we put those engagement into acquisition? Because if you don't have enough clients, it doesn't matter if you do a nice uh, recipe menu for them to, to eat more healthy. And how do you guys do it? Well, I think uh, we've spent a lot of time, of course, uh, you know, investing in our front-end digital and our full and uh, value chain offering. Uh, and clearly, the way we do it is that we're a B two B partner in, in the sense that we provide technology stacks and life and insurance license capabilities to multiple partners. We're not a distributor; we we feel they are, but we find them the technology. And I think this this acquisition challenge is so large that for any single company to figure it out themselves is something we, we find from the very So our view is really to create what we call ecosystem learnings of how we can share that experience across all of our partners. So today we are you know, in six countries with 14 different partners where all of these share the learnings about how to optimize that position cost. Nelly. Often uh, an acquisition cost is also a hot topic in e-commerce and, and fashion and you have a large footprint there. Um, my question to you is, you have a fashion uh, customer, and we're talking about the customer here. Um, how about the differences between the fashion customer and the insurance customer? Do you, do you see the differences or is it the same? Well, in terms of acquisition costs, you know, we're looking at seven steps down. So it's very different. The volume is very, very different. Um, the work of the customer is also very, very different. Um, which one is more valuable? Oh, for sure, insurance customer. And I think that's what we like to hear <laughs> on here. <laughs> that explains our pivot. <laughs> uh, you know, for for uh, fashion customer, you know, they don't need to buy these things. They don't need these shoes. They don't need any of this, right? Like they're they're using their discretionary time to to shop and purchase and browse and have these habit forming apps that we all mentioned. Whereas an insurance customer. They're there because they have to. They're there because they need to get their car on the road and they have to get their mortgage. Um, so I think as long as you know, we're cognizant of that, there, there's a number of um, e-commerce lessons that can be applied to effectively e-commerce experience of buying insurance. It's still a buying experience. You're still trying to get somebody to put down their credit card to buy your product. I think that generic formula is where it's applicable and cross it over. And what like are your top three tips you can share and we can all copy like right from tomorrow? For in terms of the yeah. insurance and fashion. <laughs> <laughs> what, can, what can we learn from the fashion industry um, 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 but if you might share? Um, so so I think one realizing and recognizing that the customer doesn't have to doesn't have to be there. Um, I think too often um, insurance companies have they place the customer last because it's, it's an obligation um, for, for them to be there. Um, following that is is E-commerce is so competitive um, that uh, you have to obsess with the customer. You have to know um, why are they there, why are they there, what will help them um, make this purchase, and just iterate and iterate and keep kind of hammering on that. So that you know, I think a, a, a flaw I've noticed in insurance that you know this is the way it's always been done, so it must it must work. And the answer to that is no, it doesn't. You're, you're dealing with a new generation of customers that you know reaching adulthood and they are um, their companies their own and they want to interact and have insurance or something that you know they don't want to do seamlessly slot into their life. John you're not right. <clears throat> so generally I agree there, there's one of the challenges with the insurance industry in my opinion is what Josh brought up earlier around the idea that it's become commoditized. And I use the, my my favorite analogy in the world that it's the credit card industry and then the airline industry. So they too are commodities. Um, yet commodities can compete in one of two vectors. One is faster, cheaper, and the insurance industry is very focused on faster, cheaper. Um, what the credit card industry has done in the airline industry has done that's really interesting is they've also created a new vector, which is you know, people don't choose American Express over Visa because of the APRs or the amount of credit they get. They choose it because it's a lifestyle brand. 
American Express pre-approves you, they know who you are, they have rewards that are targeted at you, and you engage with them through that, and they compete on that vector. And our view is that the insurance industry, in order to, to sort of get out of this, this vicious cycle of you know, cheaper, faster, um, you have to be cheaper, you have to be faster, but to be differentiated, they need to start thinking outside the box of just offering insurance and what other value-added services can we offer that will become the competitive currency that people actually want to engage with, want to choose when they're purchasing a product in the different ways that we do. I have a question. So, um, I, I love the idea, your example, what you said about lifestyle, lifestyle brands. But um, I recently read a study that um, in Central Europe, the insurance industry is not the least popular. There's one group that's even less popular, politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's competition. Um, but we're like, even, even bankers are more popular than we are. So my question is, is when we say rethinking customer experience, um, we should not even uh, go a step back and really think about the problem of um, our image and, and, and how it can and our image in the industry, is it a topic um, we should talk about and, and when we say we need to treat the customer differently? Um, so I, I, was, uh, I was writing something before we, when we came here and I was thinking a bit about that exact point, which is historically it feels to me like, especially life insurance, was like, it, it was quite a righteous project, like product when it came out originally, like it protected people if anything happened or anything bad happened, so it's a good idea. The problem is, over time, it's kind of morphed into this commission generating, you know, kind of term life of 20 years. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense anymore. So, at least to me, it's a combination of a savings product and a, a tax, it's only tax avoidance product that enables you to get out of paying tax when you get old. It isn't what it's meant to be, which is, God forbid something happens to somebody in this room, but the loved ones that we have are protected and they don't have to worry about our salary, right? So, with our family income benefits and everything, yeah, it's something that makes a lot more sense in life insurance. But, to that point, as a society, we don't focus on our needs in the same way that we used to. You only have to look across the pond of Donald Trump. And I think there's probably most of you obviously fans in here. And uh, then we've also got people um, like you know, Brexit that's going on locally and it's not before and against it. The point is, we don't care anymore about what do we need. We care far more about how does it feel, how do I feel about this topic, and therefore that is the decision that I make. And life insurance, more than any other industry, reflects to me at least something, or at least insurance, needs. Uh, and that is not where society is right now, it's on wants and desires, what feels good. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't even remember what I was going with that. No, I think um, you mentioned politicians are, are the least popular. I yes, guess, I guess, you know, I think there's another person who's not very popular, and that's the tax man. And, and, and to some extent, we are sometimes operating as a tax man. You know, uh, you pay uh, relevant tax for when you also need it on the daily basis, or when an event occurs, you need hospital cover, etc. So, uh, of course, there is an element about how we operate in terms of being there at the right time when events occur, that, that makes it not maybe always perceived the most popular. Do we have to work on the image? Absolutely. I think, is there relevant emergencies in the industry where that transparency is emerging in terms of what you pay for what you get and how you engage? I, I think we're seeing the trend of that emerging, but we have a long way to go. And I think it's, it's a combination of the industry with consumers and the regulators that need to be involved with the industry. Yeah, I, I found it quite striking if you look at three industries first, us, you know, we are saving lives, we are rebuilding homes when they're burned down, we are um, and, and getting financing tremendously expensive medical treatments to save lives of loved ones. So actually pretty cool stuff. Um, and then you have like iron things with four wheels and a motor. They are cool, we're not. Uh, or even with the little things in your pocket all the time that be. And you know, that's a lifestyle product, and, but actually us, we're like the, 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 the true, true and, and, and the saviors, we're not. So, um, Roman, maybe next to you, since you, um, you, you seem to crack the nut of customer satisfaction, um, do you have some concrete tips where you say, um, that's what we learned and, and that's how we, as a, maybe what we did as a company, can do also as an industry better? To lead into this, I think I'm still I'm still with you, Natalie. Um, yeah. that most of health insurance, most of insurers don't see customers as customers. Uh, I think I'm sure that half of the room 
thinks our main customer are the brokers or the, the uh, in-house sales force. That's what we see in our B2B business. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer is CV and customer as the customer. I mean, and they don't do this. <coughs> That's why we had, when we started our product, we took lots of people that had no health, health insurance background, no insurance background. And now that has an advantage. If we have a great NPS, it has a disadvantage as well. I must admit that. We didn't work with brokers, so we're going to start working with brokers now because we understand <coughs> that you get much more mass of customers if you do work with brokers. So maybe you will have to do a compromise somewhere. But if, if you start out with really focusing on the customer, it sounds very lame, uh, but most of the companies don't do that because they, they get their business in a totally different way. So let's, uh, I could give you a little example of what we do in our customer service where we really try to go the extra Just mile. Just the secret stuff. The secret stuff, the secret stuff is 99% of our customers uh, had a chat contact with us last year. So the secret stuff is interaction, interaction, interaction. But this is quite different uh, from, I mean, I have also a few policies um, and from different uh, carriers and what I mostly get are um, uh, uh, bills at the end of the year. Um, and um, it's a little bit different than to have like an, an engaging, engaging app there. I mean, to give you an example, we even, so, so, so the thing that you don't like is if your health insurance tells you, you know, your dentist was much too expensive, you went to one of those gold diggers and don't go there again. Now, our team found a way to say this in a nice way and made proposals where to go better and where people could read what we do in the half an hour time is you always have a little copay yourself. And so we can actually say, you know, in order for you to self to help save the copay, it will help you. So even things that are presumably bad and that lead to a bad interaction, if you look at it from the viewpoint of the customer, you can even really find those. It has to be the foremost target. And my foremost target to the company was we want to lead an NPS. I didn't say, you know, I want to have X number of customers. And my point was always, we have to do first lead an NPS, and then, then we go and attack the market for that. Just to challenge your point around customer engagement. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, you yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah, just, 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 just to challenge the point around customer engagement, right? If I, I mean, if I tell my friends about the insurance industry, and, I, and this is my first insurance experience, building an insurance company, like, they want to fall asleep. So if my insurer is contacting me, I don't want to talk to them anyway. Like, great, my insurer called me five times this week, but like, if you're going to talk to me about insurance, that's the wrong, that's not the conversation I want to have. I want to have a conversation about the tools that I'm currently using, Calm, Headspace, Audible, Netflix. Those are the conversations that I find interesting. Um, is it not the insurer's responsibility to take care of people's needs, but also if they want to continue to speak to people, they need to give them what they want. But well, maybe because you wouldn't could have an unfair advantage of the health insurance because health insurance is something where you do have regular interactions with your health with your insurance. So I think it's probably different than uh, the life insurance. So I must admit you do have an unfair advantage. But uh, again, look at the other guys who have an unfair advantage. They have an NDS of 11. Yeah. So there's but, still but, room for improvement. But I think that, uh, that's the key point. I guess we need to recognize that we shouldn't generalize the insurance industry too much. Health is, is very different from an engagement point of view. Yeah. And, you know, a life insurance policy where you, yeah. you know, despite uh, what Josh mentioned, it might be a 20 year term because it's the benefit of the client at that instant. So I guess, uh, I guess your point, Josh, is absolutely. Uh, I think when the things are a bit boring, if we put that terminology there, then there is, of course, different ways than how we should talk to the client, not about insurance, because they only want peace of mind. That's why we call it in the first place. But if there is benefits, we can get for that engagement, for them, and um, you know, taking more steps and the rest of it, yeah. and great. You know, let's engage in those, those themes that uh, create a different engagement. But, uh, so, if, so one problem I have, and this is a debate I'm having, maybe you can shed some light on, is do they want peace of mind? I don't want to say that. <laughs> because I can tell you that, like, do you want peace of mind? No, I want cheap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, do I want cheap? Do I even care? Why do we have an annex card? To your point earlier, was, you know, because I get air miles, and my friend said, you'll get 20,000 air miles when you sign up to MX card. I'm exit now, I can't, as is for many people. Um, do I care about protection anymore? And I think that is a problem, in, you know, a social problem, um, but in, maybe that assumption is probably part of the challenge the industry has in changing itself. What do you mean with that? 
do people care about life insurance? Let me chime in here. So there's a, there's a lot of chatter around, you know, are millennials going to buy insurance? Do they need insurance? They want to buy it for <coughs> And the answer turned out to be yes. They were just waiting until the same life event occurred that everyone buys life insurance, which is, uh-oh, now I have a kid, and what happens if I take the bucket? So people's behavior has changed. They might get married later, they might have kids later, but when you have a kid, I can speak firsthand, you're all of a sudden life insurance becomes something, you, you know, you're not excited to go get a paramedical exam and all that, but it's kind of one of those check the box things, I definitely need it. And, you know, you lived through the financial crisis of 2008, so the fact that they have an AM best rating of whatever, <coughs> and that they've been around for 100 years, that doesn't mean anything to you anymore. If you saw Bear, Bear Stearns go down, you saw Lehman Brothers go down, you saw what happened with AIG. So all of a sudden, emerging brands can be disruptive. I, th I think that's where the paradigm shift is. It's not, do I need insurance, but it's, do I care who I'm buying it from? And do I trust the traditional ways of, of determining risk? Or you know, am I more likely to go to one of these startup brands because, hey, at least they offer great customer service, and I have no reassurance. I have no assurance that way. Uh, I'll finish with this one point on this, which is life insurance. I think is particularly interesting because you're asking someone to basically write you a 20-year annuity every month or every year, and the only thing you show them to show that you care and that you value them is you basically send them the invoice and the policy statement. So you have this weird trust imbalance where the consumer is paying you all this money, and you're like, gosh, I hope if I'm dead, they'll pay me. Um, so you kind of, we think the carrier needs to think differently about how do they build that relationship of trust, how do they engage and show to the consumer that hey, we're, we're going to be around and we do care and we do have your best interest. Do you have some ideas how we could do it? Um, did I mention an app called? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, sorry, just one. You said millennials buy insurance. So population growth is, is what it is. So yes, you should have more, more millennials buy insurance because there's more people. Is it percentage-wise as a proportion of the community and uh, my phone is not working because this is a great Google moment and I need that gratification. But um, I'm almost certain, and I, I'm, I'm quite happy to almost be pretty certain on this, that proportionally, millennials are not buying as much insurance as they once were. I don't think that's the case. I, I think it's they once were. A, a the rest of the prior generation. So, okay, so if I, like, let's go back one parent generation, one generation back. Um, like, their, their parents had a mate who was broker, they then bought the insurance. I mean, I wasn't introduced to a broker. I think, I think the category is wrong. You should look at millennials, you should look at, you know, when people buy a car, do they buy auto insurance? When people have a kid, do they buy life insurance? When people buy a car, do they buy life insurance? I think, I think that the, the first point you made about that inner debate that millennials are having what they should buy and if they should buy it. As a millennial, that first argument, I'm not having that in my head. I'm not having this, do, do I want to go traditional route of, of, of risk assessment? Um, if, if I were to go on and on customers that are on the 38, the age bracket, if, I'm, if they're going to go the traditional route, they're going to phone their parents and ask, hey, who, what, what policy am I currently on? Can you just give me an intro and I'll talk to your broker? Or they're going to go with the company that, you know, they're getting targeted through ads and the apps that they use, which are, which are you know, Instagram, which are, you know, what are they interacting with that they're getting the, the most um, exposure to? And I think that's, that's the opportunity to transact with them. And I think that the reality of millennials not buying more insurance is we have, we have less assets. I think the prior generation was far more established in terms of assets than, than our generation is. They didn't have the economy, they're not all winters. Um, it's, it's, it's a they need more money. world. They need, more, they need more money and how that, that, that's kind of the crux of it. Right, well, just the, so I think we're, in one, one respect we're saying the same thing, which is that the fact that it's a big established brand doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we'll go with whoever's, millennials will go with whoever, everyone will go with whoever's easiest, fastest, and reasonably priced. Um, no, I don't know, I'm missing the big fact. I'm not sure that's the case. I was just waiting for your back. Yeah, we're 153 years, so I have to say that. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I, uh, what we see working with our 13 partners in, in six countries is clearly brand us now. Um, uh, the associations in terms of trust, and so uh, the, the four, you know, triple A rating in terms of what it now constitute, it still does matter, you know. And, and I think we've seen a number of examples of a lot of new emerging companies who have deployed significant amount of funds to try to develop the brand, and it's extremely difficult. Um, the incumbents 
people with the money yeah. to allow us to take risks. So the request I would make is be a supply chain, recognize what, what you've been historically, and really you know, build APIs, get it to microservices, enable new tech companies to be able to spin up and apply that risk to people with problems, and you'll discover brand new problems you never imagined were the case. Um, and for me, actually having a supply chain that's really tech enabled would be amazing. The second thing I would make is to the incumbents that don't really have the money and are packaging the products, um, my thought to you would be uh, your shareholders don't want you to massively hurt your business today or tomorrow. They would much rather that you continue your yield and dividend payout quarterly. And, uh, and actually, your focus should be on sustaining that shareholder need, obviously experimenting with what's there, but uh, allowing your shareholders to get what they're expecting from their blue chip stocks, which is what you are, and allow people like us to mess around with you know, what can come next. And some of us will crash and burn, and some of us will succeed, and um, I hope to be a succeeding. The, um, <laughs> the idea will be, though, um, I will be succeeding. No, the idea will be that that then enables your shareholders to be happy in the market to generally get what it needs from people like, like me and, and, and us and our companies. But yeah, please give me an API's work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have like a lot of additional questions left, um, but I would also love to have audience and, uh, participate a little bit. But before we do that, maybe um, um, I would love to get uh, three tips from everybody um, um, with three words. What should a carrier do to um, improve the customer experience? Um, um, many um, staffers, you Carl, what, what are your three takeaways from, from, from that? No, I, uh, one, um, don't only think you can do it yourself, partner up with others who are emerging in, in terms of experience because it's too difficult to, to get down acquisition costs. And the other thing is uh, recognize you know, data in the way of how we operate from an acquisition point of view uh, and in terms of how, how we optimize the stock. <coughs> In terms of what we just spent, because uh, what we see is the law are still applying very traditional metrics in the world. Um, I really just have one, which is around the focus of innovation. So we see a lot of focus of innovation in the industry today on faster, cheaper. Um, we think that that's, that's table six. Five years from now, everyone will be faster and everyone will be cheaper. That will not change a carrier's competitive positioning. It'll just maintain it. But a carrier needs to think sort of in a very different fashion of what is the insurance product that we're offering, what is the value added component that will differentiate it. I'll say two things quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative, you have to be a data driven company. And to be a data driven company, you have to be digitized in some way so you can actually collect the data and afterwards see what's available. And, uh, Qualitatively, you have to focus on the customer, and that means uh, don't let other people talk to the customer, talk to the customer yourself. Um, go out, uh, check the things with the customers. Uh, we rate, I regularly talk to our customers, uh, we do focus groups with our customers. Uh, it seems very normal <coughs> to say this, but uh, in large corporations, it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and that would be the quality <laughs> I feel obsessed over the customer, um, realize when the game changes. Um, also, I think one of the hardest things that we, we experienced in your first standing up um, your cover was working with the carriers themselves, which was very difficult. Um, they weren't built to, to work with us. Um, and what we had to build in order just to get prices returned um, through a mobile experience was just, it was really hard. But I, I, what would really be helpful is pricing API, finding API. I think we're, if, if they don't want to, you know, take all of this new building on themselves, work with the companies that, that will. And um, you know, we, we find work with one boutique carrier and we got a timeline of 10 years. <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, I, think, I think we all had different opinions on, on branding. Um, and I think really all that is is just an experiment way to have it. But, continually validate, is it a peace of mind? I don't think so, but that's okay. That's a good hypothesis. That's it. Gosh. Good um, so, uh, just uh, two things that I'll probably mention. One is, um, I think we, there's an ethical responsibility that we need to really think about things we can sell, the things that you guys can sell, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what does the customer need? 
actually need and how does this product reflect in that needs? And I think a lot, you know, I look at the industry and the trust aspect of it, and I think that's the weakest point in insurance right now, is that, yeah, you're right, it's doing righteous things, but I think part of the challenge you've got is the products that you're creating, that people are then selling, my question is how, how good are they for that end user? Are they really fulfilling their needs? And, uh, and, and you may say, well, I'm just a money guy, or, you know, I'm just a carrier, the broker's selling it, but it's easy to blame the broker, but if you're facilitating that, Really look at what is that thing. That would be one thing I would say to this room. The other thing would be um, okay, wait, wait, customer loyalty. Okay, play a computer game. And uh, if you, if you, I played World of Warcraft when I was uh, 15. Um, for those of you who played it, you'll know what I mean. For those of you who haven't, uh, Google, watch some videos. But I think it will explain to you what customer loyalty could look like in the future mm -hmm. and uh, how it will actually work. I'd love to dig into gaming and esports now, but I fear the time is almost over. So I would suggest if there are questions, grab one of these um, uh, panelists uh, off the stage. We're there getting our cables uh, lost or uh, outside the room. Um, uh, please uh, approach uh, us there. And um, I think, um, and first of all, I want to thank you uh, for, for joining us, spending your time here, sharing some secrets. And um, I hope that lots of the people writing things down. Um, what I would take away from this panel is that there are different views on should we engage more and how should we engage more and which line of business can we engage, which is more natural, which is not. Um, then that the trust is still a big component in the insurance industry and we need to increase that. But that there are examples that and as an insurer you actually can achieve uh, that. Um, and um, yeah, I would like uh, to close with a point John made. I think if we apply all of this, and we can not only sell more of that what we are already even providing now to our customers, I think we can expand our value chain tremendously um, and maybe also reduce them to the acquisition cost at some time. Okay, thank you very much guys. Um, and now it's time for the post panel of Selfie. <laughs>